on your tables in front of you is a little radio frequency response device. Some of us are using these in the classrooms and we decided we would try using them here. Cheryl has a few more back there. Uh, if you didn't get one and there are tables up here uh, with devices on them that aren't, uh, where they're not being used. It's important because there is a test and uh, you're gonna use those to take the test. So let's get started without further ado. The first question on the test, and there will be a timer that will come up in a moment, is a word scramble. We use these just as a warm up. And you need to pick the set of letters that completes that word. Okay? The timer is starting now. You have 30 seconds. And if you see the little bar up there at the top, you see the responses coming in. By the way, I have a student who does these word scrambles the instant I put them up on the screen. 10 seconds. Five seconds. Only 60 of you, 63 of you got in before the time. And 83% of you answered number two. And 83% of you are correct. The word is constitution. So now you're warmed up. The rest of the questions are for real. Where do you find the law? The constitution, the statutes, the courts, the government administrators, all of the above or none of the above? Whoa, that one came up before you all got your responses in. <laughs> the answer is all of the above. And, uh, the reason is this. We have uh, guests that I'm going, to interview, I'm going to introduce here in a little bit. Uh, most of them, uh, or three of them, have been in, three of us have been in the practice of law. And if you go to a lawyer and ask what the law is, their most common answer is, you know, I don't know, I'll check that out. Uh, because they have to look at a number of sources. In order to find the law today, you have to look in the Constitution, which is the source of all law in the United States, then to the statutes, and then to the case law, and then to administrative law. Throughout the course of the day, we will uh, be talking about how those pieces fit together uh, and how that has evolved over time. The second problem in finding the law is that you have both state law and federal law, you have state civil law and state criminal law, you have federal civil law and federal criminal law, and as if that weren't enough, you have municipal law from all the different municipalities, all the cities, all the counties have laws. And so when we look for the law, we have to look in a myriad of places to find the answer to your question. Okay, we're ready for another test question. <clears throat> How many pages is the Constitution without the amendments in an eight and a half by 11 format Times New Roman font? Seventy-five responses in. 77, slower students are coming in. <laughs> All right, 79, are you in yet, Ray? Yeah. All right, 80. Okay, we'll go with that group. The answer is eight pages, uh, and most of you got that right. Let me pause here for a moment and ask you a question. How many of you had a civics class, whether by that name or some other name, uh, at any point in your uh, schooling career where you actually read the Constitution? I'm not talking about a history class where you talked about it. That's unusual. What's interesting, keep those hands up. I don't want to comment on anybody's age, but look at the people in the room who had that experience. <laughs> <clears throat> and that tells you something about what's going on in our schools today. <clears throat> 
All right, next question. Now these are getting more tricky. What is the source of the U.S. government's authority to regulate speed limits within the states? What is the source of the U.S. government's authority to regulate speed limits within the states? Seventy-seven of you are in. Forty-nine percent of you answered the statutes, um, and uh, twenty-five percent of you answered the courts, and the answer is government administrators. This is one of the ways the executive branch, we, we think of, when we think of aggressive courts, we always think of the courts, but the executive branch is sticking its head in the door too because they have money to give away. And when you have money to give away, you can influence people. And if you want to have money for your highways in the state, you have to agree to the federal speed limit. Uh, there, of course, is no federal speed limit, but uh, they give that to you so that you can have your highway money. How does a federal judge retire? Resigns his or her position and applies for retirement under the Federal Act, Retirement Act, quits coming to work except when he or she wants to, or takes mandatory retirement at age 70. This is actual. Seventy-five, eighty, two of you haven't responded yet. Seventy-nine, Ray, it's time for you to answer now. <laughs> Looks like we're only going to get seventy-nine. Somebody bowed out. Sixty-eight percent of you said resigns his or her position and applies for retirement under the Federal Retirement Act. The correct answer is actually he quits coming to work uh, except when he wants to. Now, the judiciary has for itself set some rules that they call the rule of 80, uh, which says if your age and your years of service equal 80, you can take senior status. But the truth is federal judges appointed under Article Three of the Constitution never retire. Uh, they just get paid their salary until they die. And if they decide to take senior status, they take senior status and then uh, they can come in and take cases once in a while if they decide to do that. Not a bad gig if you can get it. Okay? What are the qualifications for becoming a federal judge? We've got a lot more people voting on this one. Five seconds left. Five of you, or uh, most of you said all of the above. The an correct answer is none of the above. <laughs> there are no qualifications in the Constitution for a federal judge. Now, the people who appoint judges have come up with their standards, and the Senate uh, has come up with its standards, but there are actually no required qualifications to be a federal judge. Okay, which of the following is the source of the enforcement of benefit regulations? Now, let me explain this one a little bit. We all know that there are all kinds of laws that regulate benefits. But the primary one that I'm talking about is health insurance benefits, what's called the non-discriminatory non provisions of health insurance benefits. What, how does the federal government require your employer uh, to comply uh, 
to make sure that all the people in the company have equal benefits. Sixty-one percent of you said federal regulations. The actual answer is the Internal Revenue Code. If you don't provide equal benefits to all of your employees, you don't get to deduct the cost of those benefits on your tax return. Well, the point of all of these is that there are a lot of ways that the federal government figures out ways to get in to regulate our lives. I would argue that not all of those ways were intended from the beginning, and that's what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about impacting our culture in support of the original intent of the Constitution. And the good news for you is you don't have to listen to me very much because I've brought you some experts. Uh, the first person you're going to hear from is Senator John Andrews. Um, he's going to talk about the history of our Constitution and the nature of its creation. John is a fellow at the Claremont Institute in Denver. He's former president of the Colorado Senate. He's a university instructor in politics. He's an appointee of President Bush on the Foreign uh, Subsidiaries Commission. Uh, he's a host of a radio talk show called Backbone Radio. He has regular commentary for Colorado Public Television and the Denver Post. He consults for legislative leaders in many states. Uh, he was a White House speechwriter for President Nixon. He uh, was on the civil rights appointee. He was a civil rights appointee for President Reagan. And he was the chairman of the Education Council for the first President Bush. In 1990, he was a Republican nominee for governor of Colorado. And he has served in the U.S. Navy as a submarine officer. He and his wife have uh, two grown children and a grandchild, three grown children and a grandchild. And uh, John is going to be talking to us today uh, from a perspective of having been involved in government literally from the time that he left college and is a really uh, good understanding of how these processes work. Then we're going to hear from Judge David Furman, who's going to give us a case history that I have labeled, he probably wouldn't have used this label, from judicial interpretation to judicial activism. Dave has a BA in uh, psychology and Christian education from, West, from Wheaton College. He has an MSW from uh, Denver, Seminar, or, or Denver uh, Graduate School, University of Denver Graduate School. He has a JD from the University of Denver. He's admitted to practice law in all of the Colorado courts and in the Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit and the United States Supreme Court. He was a deputy public defender in the appellate division for the Colorado Public Defender's Office. He was in private practice. He was a magistrate in the Denver Juvenile Court and the Denver District Courts. And he was appointed to the Colorado Court of Appeals in December of 2005. He's the author of a number of publications, including several judicial desk books and a book entitled Law in Social Work Practice. He's an adjunct professor at CCU and at the University of Denver. And last but not least, we have Brad Abramson, who is a practicing attorney and has been in Denver for 26 years, and I think I've known Brad almost all of that time. He's admitted to practice law in Colorado, in the U.S. District Court, in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, in the United States Supreme Court. In 1984, he was the Colorado Bar Association uh, association winner of the pro bono award. That's attorneys who give their services away uh, for needy people. He's published a number of articles in the Colorado, for the Colorado Bar Association. He has a number of reported cases in the appellate court system. He's a Martindale and Hubble AV rated attorney, which is the top rating you can get uh, from your peers and from the judges uh, in the area in which you practice. And he was a case reviewer and actually a senior editor uh, for Shepherds. So as you can see, all of these people bring a lot of qualifications to the table. And they're going to share with us today uh, about what's happened to our Constitution. I want to close by telling you the story of a mother and daughter who were cooking a ham at Christmas time. And uh, the mother proceeded to cut the end off of the ham. And the daughter said, why do you do that? She said, well, I don't really know. My mother always did that. So they called her mother and said, why do you cut the end off of the ham? She said, well, I really don't know. My mother always did that. So they called great grandma. They said, why did you cut the end off of the ham? And she said, because my roaster was too small. <laughs> That's a really good illustration 
for what happens in our country. Way too many of us do not read the Constitution. We only know about the Constitution what we've heard from others. Let's be original studiers of the Constitution. Senator? Chuck King, thank you, and friends at Colorado Christian University, thank you. I'm delighted to be with you today. Sherry Parks told you you were going to be hearing from some judges and from some lawyers. Well, under the format of the quiz you just took, I'm in the heading none of the above. <laughs> but I must say, uh, Chuck, I'm indebted to you. My, my aspirations um, for becoming a federal judge just took a huge leap since there are no qualifications. <laughs> All of that plus the attractive opportunity to retire in place on unbelievably favorable terms. It sounds like a, a job we should all be competing for. I am John Andrews, former state senator, now with the Claremont Institute. I've been a great admirer and supporter of Colorado Christian University since I began to know of your good work here and follow it back in the 19. 90s. I've had the occasion to know a few of you over those years, and I've been looking forward to the time with you today, not just the presentation, but the discussion that I think we'll have later as an opportunity for knowing more of you. During the years that I've followed CCU, I've, I've observed the excellent contributions of several presidents. When my old friend, former U.S. Senator Bill Armstrong, accepted the presidency a couple of years ago, I saw a distinctively different, new, and important contribution forthcoming from him, especially when I learned of the strategic objectives that he was setting forth and obtaining the buy-in from all of the stakeholders and constituents of the, of the university. That's the occasion of our being together today. When I heard about the strategic objectives, I was a little bit in the position of the, the boy on our street, little Michael, who had started in first grade. He was getting straight A's and everything, but he was doing terribly in math. As he moved into second and third grade, his parents realized without the foundation in math and arithmetic, all their boy's potential could not be realized. They transferred him from a public school in the neighborhood to a charter school a little further away. That didn't help. They transferred him then to an expensive private school. Still no progress in math. A's in everything, D's and F in math. By this time, Michael was in the fourth grade. They signed him up for one of those Kumon math uh, tutoring programs in the storefront centers that you see. Still no progress. Well, they weren't a religious family, but as a last resort, they talked to St. Thomas More Parochial School, a couple blocks south of where I live in Centennial. And things really turned around. When they transferred Michael into St. Thomas More in the middle of his fourth grade year, the math papers began to improve instantly. And after a couple of weeks at the first parent-teacher conference, the teacher said, you know, your boy is good in everything, but he is just exceptionally good in math. Mom and Dad couldn't figure it out. They sat down with Michael at the dinner table and, and they said, Son, what is it that's made the difference? We tried everything. We're so thrilled that you're finally mastering this. He said, You know, the first day at St. Thomas More Parochial School, I looked up on the wall. When I saw that guy nailed to the plus sign, I knew they meant business. <laughs> And I thought the world uh, of President Donna Thorne. In fact, uh, what I learned from Larry about uh, the, the, uh, the relevance of the ancient Stoics uh, to, in today's world, uh, Epictetus and the gang, I was grateful for that. I enjoyed knowing Ron Schmidt in prior years to that. But when I saw Bill Armstrong's strategic objectives for this university, I knew he meant business. For context, since I don't live with these every day as the rest of you do, let's just remind ourselves that the, the paragraph uh, 
within the uh, 10 or 12 bullet points of the strategic objectives that particularly engages us in this series of discussions is about impacting our culture. And it talks about impacting our culture in support of traditional family values, sanctity of life, compassion for the poor, biblical view of human nature, limited government, personal freedom, free markets, natural law, original intent of the Constitution, our subject today, and Western civilization. I hope I can show you, and with the help of my colleagues uh, that will succeed me uh, as we team teach this morning, and then we come to our discussion, I hope I can, I can make the case that for America to be rededicated to the original intent of the Constitution is indispensable for the realization of a number of those other objectives th that are laid out uh, in, in, under the heading of impacting the culture. In, in fact, uh, absent fidelity to the original intent of our U.S. Constitution, I, I would argue that w we would have a hard time upholding almost, almost any of them. Traditional family values are at risk. The sanctity of life is at risk. Some would say compassion for the poor is only served by going outside the boundaries of the original Constitution. I would argue that compassion for the poor can only be served by staying within its boundaries. A biblical view of human nature, limited government, personal freedom, and free markets, each in its way is at risk when Americans would depart from the original intent of the Constitution. Now I'm up here, as I've already acknowledged, uh, not as a, a specialist in this field. I'm not a, an attorney, I'm not a judge. I have been a practicing politician and, and public office holder for parts of my life and in other parts of my life I've been involved in supporting those who hold positions of public trust or doing public policy analysis and trying to make recommendations on better ways to do that from the outside. Just as it's said that the war is too important to be left to the generals and that our health is too important to be left to doctors, I think there's a case to be made that you and I as citizens have both an uh, obligation and, and, uh, and an opportunity to be equally as involved and concerned about what the Constitution does and doesn't mean and whether proper stewardship uh, of it is being exercised by those who have, who have taken the oath uh, to it, holding public office in our state or, or in our nation. I have taken that oath a series of times beginning when I became a naval officer later when I worked on President Nixon's staff and held those other presidential appointments that Chuck King mentioned most recently in the two terms that I served in the Senate of Colorado. I swore an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and I take that oath very seriously. Whether or not any of us have ever actually taken such an oath, we need to take it. We need to take it seriously. My doctor has some responsibility over my health, but I have primary responsibility over my own. My health, my, my nutrition, my fitness, the whole notion of self-care. And if we understand that the Constitution is the central nervous system of the body politic, then a as citizens who participate in the, the body politic, we need to be, I think, more attentive to the care of the Constitution. If that central nervous system is in disorder or decline, then the body politic itself, which we're so blessed to have inherited from those who sacrificed and worked and in some cases gave their lives, that system uh, itself is, is at risk. This is, I think, the relevance of focusing our attention on what the Constitution should mean and does mean in uh, this uh, series that's continuing today. I'd like to cover five main points. What do we mean by the Constitution? What do we mean by its original intent? What is the alternative to original intent? Why can it be argued that original intent is superior to the alternative in its benefits for self-government in our country and in its, in its protection of the other key elements in your strategic objectives? And if we can agree that original intent is superior, finally, fifth, what can we do to impact our culture 
in support of original intent. W what's gone wrong? Why, why is original intent even a, a debatable matter? I was interested to learn from Chuck King that some have anticipated that the original intent of the Constitution might be among the more debatable or, or controversial topics that will be covered in your strategic objectives. That says something, if true, interesting about where we are uh, as Americans today in our, in our civic literacy. But I welcome the discussion that I hope we'll be able to have later, and I think we can shed some light as well as generate some heat. The Federalist Papers, co-authored by James Madison, known as the father of our Constitution, who was later the fourth president, Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, are the best explanation of what the framers of the Constitution thought they were doing, why we needed a Constitution, and having laid that groundwork, then they explained what the Constitution was was intended to accomplish and tried to allay the fears of the anti-federalists at the ratification debates of 1788 as to whether the Constitution, in fact, would be a step back from the liberties of the previous governing charter called the Articles of Confederation that had prevailed since the Declaration of Independence. In Federalist Papers number 51, Madison says, what is government but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? Reflection on human nature. If men were angels, says Madison, no government would be necessary. But we know that isn't true. He continues. If angels were to govern men, that is if we could find some superior race or order of beings in their wisdom, their virtue, their incorruptibility, their foresight, their purity of motive. If angels were to govern men, says Madison, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In other words, you just trust it to some, to some beings and let those beings do with it as they thought best. That's a little bit of an echo of the philosopher king ideal that Plato spelled out in his Republic 2,500 years ago. Now Madison continues in Federalist 51. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, he's dispensed with the fantasy about being angels. There's no, if I may indulge in current politics for just a moment, there's no yes we can chant here. There's no messiah complex about somebody being our savior. Men are going to govern men, as imperfect as men are. Says Madison, in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, Here's the great difficulty. You must first enable the government to control the governed. And in the second place, oblige it to control itself. Government has got to be strong enough to restrain our passions, our foolishness, our impulses to do harm to one another, take unfair advantage of one another, defraud one another because we're not angels, because we are, as you and I theologically understand it, we are fallen creatures. Government has got to be strong enough to control the governed, but Madison then adds, you've got to oblige the government to control itself. And he wraps up this important par uh, pa passage of Federal 51 by, by saying, a dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government. But experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. In a way, this little constitution, less than the eight pages, which would, would have been on eight and a half, 11, because the type is small, it's, it's uh, I think, only seven pages in the version that we've given you from our, our Claremont Institute uh, pocket edition. Uh, this little constitution is the auxiliary precautions to to oblige the government to control itself. My friend Fred Holden, a gifted author and speaker here in Lakewood, likes to say that in the law book, we find the government telling the people what to do. And as Chuck reminded us earlier, it's not just the law book, it's the Code of Federal Regulations. It's sometimes executive branch edicts or the IRS code. 
But as Fred Holden puts it, in the law book, we, find that we see the government telling the people what to do. That's the first half of Madison's controlling the governed. But the Constitution is where the people tell the government what to do. That's the restraining. That's the obliging the government to control itself. What are the first three words in the U.S. Constitution? Even if you took a rather mediocre civics class and you took it 60 years ago, you probably know the first three words to the preamble. Anybody? We the people. We the people. So as Madison says, the primary reliance for controlling the, obliging the government to control itself is to rely upon the people. But we need auxiliary precautions, and that's where the mechanisms of the Constitution with the division of powers and the separation of powers divided between federal and state like layers in a cake and separated into the three branches, <coughs> legislative in Article I, executive in Article II, judicial in Article III. That's where the checks and balances come in. And the The simple little few thousand words, few hundred words really, in the U.S. Constitution are our primary reliance that government will not begin to take unto itself powers beyond what all human experience, as Madison warned, can wisely be trusted. The framers of the Constitution and the authors of the Federalist Papers, while most of them were Bible-believing Christians or at least deists, who believe with reservations in the Bible, they made their arguments on behalf of what is today called public reason. They did not invoke scripture. But I think in this setting, it's appropriate for us to remember that from the earliest uh, books of the Law of Moses and through the prophets and into the New Testament, we have scriptural warrant for valuing a written order of government. In Deuteronomy, we find Moses giving God's outline, the seventh chap 17th chapter of Deuteronomy, Moses gives God's outline for when and if they would have a king after they come into the promised land, what that king, what his qualifications should be, and what ought to be the limitations on his power. Deuteronomy 17. I only recently was reminded of that passage. I was always more familiar with the eighth chapter of 1 Samuel, where after the time of the judges, corrupt judges, let us remember, unfaithful judges, a time when the Bible says everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Then Samuel is implored by the people, give us a king like the other nations. And in the eighth chapter of 1 Samuel, he says, if you want a king, be prepared for how heavily he will tax you. He will make enforced labor or conscription of your children. He may confiscate your lands. He will live very richly himself. A litany of warnings of how a king will abuse power. With a bottom line for the people, we want a king anyway. So God says to Samuel, all right, let them learn the hard way. They get Saul, and then they get the whole line of ups and downs. The peaks of the va and valleys of the rest of the kings in the New Testament are just extraordinary. By the time we come to the 13th chapter of Romans in the New Testament, or the second chapter of, of the first letter of Paul to Timothy, we've we get what, if taken out of context, sounds like you just bend the knee to the king or to the constituted authority without regard to whether they're using power responsibly or not. I think in the, in the properly understood context of scripture, the responsible use of the power of government uh, is, is in fact sketched out. And it was filled out in its most uh, inspired detail in the Constitution of the United States in the late 18th century at Philadelphia. And the, um, the danger of departing from the original intent of the written text ultimately gets us back to the condition of the biblical days of the judges where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Or it gets us back to what Madison hypothetically uh, discarded in, in half a sentence, which is to say, we don't have angels to govern us, so we do need external and internal controls on government. Essentially, the notion that five judges of the US Supreme Court, 
or four of the seven member Colorado State Supreme Court can say that the Constitution means whatever they think it should, even if their motive is very good, even if they're trying to act as philosopher kings in the way that um, P Plato speculated about 25 centuries ago, I think ought to concern us greatly because we understand the fallenness of human nature. And at an institution like Colorado Christian University, which takes in your statement of faith the belief in the Bible as the inspired only authoritative word of God and which has in your strategic objectives the charge to teach students to trust the Bible as a foundation from which they will live holy lives and, and, and go out into the world as evangelists. At an institution like this, certainly, we ought not to be afraid or in any way feel as though someone is trying to put something over on us if we're told that by the best thinking of wise people 200 and some years ago, we are given a written plan for government. I've given you the first three articles of the Constitution. It's the three branches, legislative in the first article, executive in the second article, judicial in the third. The fourth article talks about the relations between the states and the federal government. The fifth article talks about how the Constitution itself will be amended. The founders did not saddle upon us an unchanging and unchangeable written charter. There's a doctrine in law from uh, French, Mort Main. It means dead hand. This is not Mort Main, this Constitution. We're not under the dead hand of Hamilton, J. Madison and the others, as wise as they may have been. And there, there are those who want to remind us that among them were slaveholders, and among them were propertied men who were trying to entrench their economic advantage. But for better or worse, call, a, call them geniuses or call them, as Charles Beard and some other authors do, simply men who were cynically trying to entrench their own privilege and advantage with their foot on the neck of the black man. We're not saddled with an unchangeable instrument, but what we have is a process of law and rules to follow of how to change it. And what I look forward to hearing from Brad and from Judge Furman is a spelling out of the way in which the interpretive doctrine has run away with the understanding of the Constitution in our country. I'll give you a couple of examples from the last several years. One is deeply serious, one is quite laughable, but they show how far we have gotten from people understanding what they, their oath to the Constitution means. The serious example is that George W. Bush said the McCain-Feingold campaign finance regulations, in his belief, were unconstitutional because they deprived us of free speech in the political realm. Sadly, our courts give much protection to free speech about pornography or free speech in, as they call it, expression, burning a flag. Not as much protection to speech in the political realm, which is the whole reason free speech is protected. Bush said, I'm going to sign this anyway. This isn't up to me to veto this. He said, I'm going to let the Supreme Court sort it out. So at that point, the Congress had disregarded their oath to interpret the Constitution, protect it and follow it as best they could. So had the President. They punted to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court then gave everyone the un unpleasant surprise of upholding McCain-Feingold. A subsequent case, the Wisconsin Right to Life last year, has taken some of the burden off McCain-Feingold. There's still a lot of bad things in there. This is because the two branches disregarded their oath to uphold the Constitution and just punted it to the third branch. The absurd example is that old Senator Harry Byrd of West Virginia when he wasn't getting extraordinary amounts of federal money to give his uh, mountainous state the best highway system of the 50 states, Senator Byrd put through something ostensibly to make us love and respect our Constitution. And he used the very lever that Chuck King reminded us of. You won't get federal education money at your college or your elementary and secondary school system in Colorado or any other state if you don't have a Constitution Day observance around September 17th every fall. What's laughable but also outrageous about it is that there is no authority for the federal government to mandate upon Colorado Christian University or Jefferson County Schools or any school or university anywhere that it will do something in September to teach the Constitution. So Harry Byrd and the rest of the Congress, and again Bush signed it, 
in violation of the Constitution itself, said you will glorify the Constitution. It gives me a chill because it reminds me of the lip service paid under the false kings and the apostate priests at different periods in ancient Israel, the lip service paid to obeying the law of the Lord when in fact they were doing nothing of the kind. This is the danger of, of where we are today. Over at the University of Colorado Law School, there's a distinguished professor of constitutional law named Robert Nagel. Nagel has warned in a very important article that the mentality of judges and lawyers distrusts the democratic process. It distrusts we the people. I don't have time to read you the exact quotes. National Review, November 2005, if you're interested in looking it up. It's called The Problem with the Court. But he says, the combination of the tendency of judges and lawyers to believe they can improve on the messiness and the conflicts of the democratic process by handing down clean, simple, elegantly uh, worded verdicts, combined with the tendency in judicial interpretation to say that the Constitution really only means what judges say it will mean, has completely cut us loose from this, this original charter. I made the analogy to problems in the body politic. I said the Constitution is like our central nervous system. To give you a more high-tech analogy, these few pieces of paper with ink on them, they take the place of all of the force and fear that ancient tyrants used to govern people, to restrain their baser impulses or to keep them from exercising their legitimate freedom. They're like the operating system. If you have $10,000 worth of computer hardware and you don't have this 79 cent piece of shiny plastic with the right magnetic code on it, your computer hardware is no good. The operating system of the United States of America and the state of Colorado is embodied in our Constitution. It has bugs in it. It has got virus in it. As we work our way back to upholding original intent, we have to find a way to clean up that code or the whole system is going to crash and we will have been unfaithful to those who have gone before us from whom we inherit America, those who will come after us, including your students at this university who look to us to pass along to them the America that we've so fortunate, so blessed to have inherited. I think that's my opening contribution and I pass it over to, uh, who's next, Professor? Judge Corbett. The judge. It's a Friday afternoon, it's gorgeous outside, and I'm going to lecture you on constitutional law. Uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to read a little bit of uh, provisions out of the Declaration. I want to read some provisions uh, from Federalist Papers, and then I'm going to have you play judge. I think you said you wanted to be a judge, so I'll give you that opportunity. Um, what I wanted to do is to start by looking at the Declaration and looking at the judicial branch in the context of its creation. And of course, Congress on July 4, 1776, our founding fathers issued that declaration and it stated, I think you have it at the beginning of uh, what Senator Andrews passed out, if you take a look at that, it stated that people are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, including the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to secure those rights, governments are instituted, decreeing powers from the consent of the people. Well, our founding fathers recognized that the history of the King of Great Britain was a history of injuries and usurpations that have the object, the establishment of absolute tyranny over the states. We don't write like that anymore. Well, to prove this, the Declaration listed some grievances, and they're listed there in front of you. I wanted to focus on two in particular. First, he, the king, has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws establishing judicial powers. In other words, the king did not want an independent judiciary that would stand up to him. <clears throat> 
Second, he has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. In other words, he sought to influence judges by firing them or cutting their salaries. Well, when our founding fathers enacted the Constitution, they created the three branches of government. In the legislative and executive branches, people would be elected and have limited terms of office. However, in the judicial branch, judges would be appointed for life and would have a salary that would not be diminished. Well, this ensured that judges would be able to stand against the king, if you will, to protect the rights of individuals and not be swayed by current politics, popular culture, or others in authority. In the Federalist Papers, number 78, Hamilton explains, the courts were designed to be an intermediate body between the people and the legislature in order, among other things, to keep the latter within the limits assigned to their authority. Hamilton explains that this does not suppose a superiority of the judicial to the legislative power. It only supposes that the power of the people is superior to both. And that where the will of the legislature declared in its statutes stands in opposition to that of the people <coughs> declared in the Constitution, the judges ought to be governed by the latter rather than the former. They ought to regulate their decisions by the fundamental laws rather than by those which are not fundamental. Well, of course, this doesn't mean that judges may substitute their own pleasure for the constitutional intentions of the legislature. Or does it? Well, we all learned in civics class that courts interpret the laws to resolve disputes, right? How many had civics classes as you were growing up? Did you read the Constitution in those classes? How many have read the Constitution? Well, then you should have the answers to what I'm going to give you in a few minutes. Uh, occasionally, judges have to determine whether a law offends the Constitution. Now, suppose you're a judge. And let's say you're asked to determine whether a law that discriminates against people on the basis of their skin color violated the Constitution. What would you say? We had laws on the books that would discriminate against people on the basis of their skin color. Would that be constitutional? What do you think? What's that? No, no answer? You don't know. You said you wanted to be a judge. This is easy. Can states discriminate against people on the basis of their skin color? Absolutely not. Violates the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. Now, if you as a judge were to strike down one of those laws, would you be substituting your own will for what the state legislature said? Not a thought? You wouldn't? going to get a little more challenging. We get more subtle. Now that was the easiest one, I assure you. Let's suppose you're a judge and you asked, uh, you're asked to determine whether a state may enforce its own criminal laws forbidding sodomy. These are all true cases. In uh, Texas, two police officers were executing a warrant, went inside the home and found two consenting adult males uh, having sex. They were charged under the state's anti-sodomy law. Now let's say that was uh, brought before you and challenged as unconstitutional. How would you rule? This is easy. I thought this was easy stuff. No answers at all. Nobody's going to even take a stab at it? Doesn't the state have to uphold the law and then you can have an appeal to a higher court? It's correct, but the trial judge has to make a ruling in the first instance. Mm 
Okay, so you think that would be upheld, a challenge to that? I think it would be overturned. Why? Um, she said she thinks it would be overturned. Now, I asked you all if you read the Constitution, so this should be crystal clear. No real clear answers on that? Well, this is a case... Uh, called Lawrence versus Texas. It went up to the United States Supreme Court and the Supreme Court determined that those laws were unconstitutional. You know how they came up with that? That's correct. Now is, is the, you've got the Constitution in front of you. Is the right to privacy in there? No. It's not in there anywhere? So where'd they come up with the right to privacy? Anybody know? They based it on a, uh, a lot of rights. Brad is going to clarify uh, the penumbra of rights that we're talking about. Well, I'll give you an easier one then. The state of Massachusetts had a law that banned gay marriage. All right, two women wanted to uh, marry and uh, they brought the matter to court. You're a judge. What do you do with that? True case? Do you all read the paper? This was only about a year or two ago. The judges didn't have to, uh, the so have to uphold the law. It's going to uphold the law, so he's going to say you can't get married? In the first instance, if that's the law. The law in Massachusetts uh, banned gay marriage. What's the Constitution say about this? It's not real clear, huh? So what do you, what, you're a judge, what are you gonna do? Punt? No, no thoughts? Went up to the mass, did anybody hear about this case? You just forget what they did? Went up the Massachusetts Supreme Court. They determined that the law that banned gay marriage was unconstitutional, and they ordered the Massachusetts legislature to enact a law that recognized gay marriage, and they had six months to do so. All right. Let's say that couple moves to Colorado. Do we have to recognize the gay marriage? Why? Okay, we have our own law on it, but if you look at Article 4 of the U.S. Constitution, that's the full faith and credit clause. That says every state has to accord full faith and credit to the laws of every other state. All right, here's another easy one. Y'all aren't, aren't contributing much here, so this, this will be easy. A student council at Texas again voted to have a student pray before a football game. Remember the, anybody remember this case? Well, the student did so and concluded the prayer in Jesus' name, amen. The, uh, there was an atheist in the audience and the atheist was not happy with that and sued. Well, let's say you're a judge. They bring the matter into your courtroom and uh, the Constitution uh, says that it forbids the establishment of, of a state religion. And that's the grounds. What would you do? Okay. I would go with the no prohibit the free exercise thereof side of that. There's two provisions at work here, right? There's the free exercise of religion clause and then there's the establishment clause. So you would go with the free exercise clause. Everybody else? No? Freedom of speech, Freedom of speech. okay. <laughs> Went up to the United States Supreme Court. Does anybody know what they did with that law? Kind of remember? Yeah. 
They said a student-led prayer was unconstitutional. It was a gathering of people. They actually uh, went down the road that this violated the Establishment Clause, that by a student praying in Jesus' name was tantamount to establishing a religion. One of the doctrines that the court in those cases uses is separation of church and state. So they struck it down. Getting back to the Founding Fathers, Hamilton contrasts the differences between the various branches of government. Whoever attentively considers the different departments of power must perceive that in a government in which they are separated from each other, the judiciary, from the nature of its functions, will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution, because it will be least in a capacity to annoy or injure them. The executive not only dispenses the honors, but holds the sword of the community. The legislature not only commands the purse, but prescribes the rules by which the duties and rights of very citizens are to be regulated. The judiciary, on the contrary, has no influence over either the sword or the purse. Hamilton concludes, the simple view of the matter suggests several important consequences. It proves incontestably that the judiciary is beyond comparison the weakest of the three branches. Well, I think uh, few would argue that's the case today. And I'm gonna suggest there's a couple of reasons for that. First, uh, I was asking you all some of these questions and not many answered, but where does society get its moral compass? How do we decide these questions? Okay, each of the individuals participating in the democracy, right? Which would be the legislative branch and the executive branch. But who is being asked to decide these primarily today? The judiciary. And do you know how you win a case in the U.S. Supreme Court? Anybody know? There's nine people, you get five votes, you win. And society right now is saying to the Supreme Court, you can decide these things, and they are. Now there's a second issue that has been going on for quite some time, and that has to do with law schools. When I was in law school a long time ago, I was uh, taught how to interpret court opinions. I didn't spend a lot of time in, in legislation looking at statutes. This is due in part to a debate that Brad will discuss in a few minutes here that has emerged as to how the Supreme Court should interpret the Constitution. There's on one side what's known as a liberal theory, and that's articulated by Ronald Dworkin and Lawrence Tribe. And liberal, I don't mean in the political sense, but in the sense of how one approaches constitutional interpretation. Under this theory that's taught in law schools, it views the Constitution as a living and breathing document. And that means that it's responsive to changing social conditions. So followers of this theory would say it was appropriate for the court to develop the right of privacy in response to questions involving abortion or gay rights. Well, Justice Kennedy used that approach when writing for the majority in Lawrence versus Texas. That was a sodomy case I mentioned a few minutes ago. In his opinion, he referenced the European Court of Human Rights and other foreign courts. The conservative theory, on the other hand, is articulated by former Chief Justice Rehnquist and Scalia. They criticize that approach because it allows judges to substitute their own value judgments for the values that can be deemed from the language and intent of the framers. This conservative theory seeks to ascertain and uphold intent from the strict language of the text itself. Well, Scalia and Rehnquist dissented in the Lawrence case and stated that the views of other nations cannot be imposed on Americans through our Constitution. Well, while you may disagree with the Supreme Court opinions and feel the court has strayed from what was intended by our forefathers, I wanted to read a couple of passages of scripture. Romans 13, I've actually quoted this in court in the past, 
when I was about to throw somebody in jail. But anyway, <clears throat> Romans 13 says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold, hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, for he is God's servant to do you good. And then in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, it says, I urge you then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceable and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases our Savior. Well, every day when I'm on the court, I work hard to make correct decisions. And the cases are many and very difficult. I'm usually working six to seven days a week. That's why I usually have coffee in my hand. But without my wonderful staff, the work would be impossible. And I would just ask that you pray for the court and for what I do and others in my position. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to tackle the, stu the tough stuff. Not that Judge Furman's wasn't tough. Um, you're going to have to take my word for it. This morning, I was told by uh, Dean King that I went way over my time limit, and he threatened me this afternoon if I did the same. So I was much more entertaining this morning. <laughs> um, what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon is constitutional interpretation. What I intend to do and hope to do, and you guys can be the judge of whether I'm successful or not in it, is to discuss, um, identify and define some of the more well-recognized theories or modes of constitutional interpretation. I intend to discuss the respective advantages and disadvantages and to discuss if it matters, which interpretational theory you use and why it matters if it does. The phrase constitutional interpretation refers to a theory or mode of how judges should interpret the Constitution of the United States. It can apply to other, other legislative enactments as well, but since we're talking about the Constitution of the United States today, I'm going to limit my comments to that. Um, it's probably true in my experience that many judges do not consciously apply uh, or adopt a particular sort of constitutional interpretation when they're making uh, decisions. Some do, of course. but I believe it's probably true that few judges restrict themselves to only one type of constitutional interpretation, um, and that oftentimes many judges probably uh, approach constitutional interpretation in an informal uh, and almost subconscious manner when they're making decisions without necessarily even realizing how they are reaching the decisions they reach and without necessarily attempting to be consistent with respect to how they do that. Um, I think that in many instances, judges, judges themselves may not recognize the underlying principles that are guiding their reasoning, or worse, they may be using whatever reasoning they feel is necessary to get them to the result they want to get to. Um, most judges don't express opinions on constitutional interpretation at all. But one of the interesting things that has occurred in, this, in, in, say, the last 10 to 15 years is that this idea or concept of constitutional interpretation has come clearly into the public view. And one of the reasons it has is because of the nature of certain cases that have been cited. And in addition, something that's peculiar in, in Supreme Court history, which is that some of the justices have taken public positions with respect to what is the appropriate constitutional interpretation theory that should be used. You would never see that before, but now you're seeing, in particular, two of the justices on the US Supreme Court, um, Justice Antonin Scalia and Justice Stephen Breyer, not only taking public positions on constitutional interpretation theory, but actually debating it in public forums, on television and in books and on radio and in the newspapers. So um, that's how it's sort of come to the fore and has, has garnered the sort of attention um, that it has garnered. 
So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to discuss some of these uh, theories of constitutional interpretation. And just so, for sort of a benchmark, there's kind of a, a polarization of constitutional interpretation. On the one hand, there are the theories referred to as formalism, and on the other hand, there are th theories that kind of are grouped under the idea of the living constitution theory. It goes by different names, but that's usually how you hear it um, referred to as. Um, and under the formalism side of the uh, spectrum, the first kind of uh, theory is called textualism, okay, textualism. And that's a formalist theory that maintains that the Constitution's meaning should be gleaned from the common and ordinary meaning of the text itself without recourse to inquiries into non-textual sources such as the intention of the drafters, the issue or issues the provision was intended to address, or extra-constitutional sources. The essence of textualism is that a judge should be able to interpret a constitutional provision merely by reading it, period. Merely by reading it, period. Although most textualists would concede that they need to read it in the context of the Constitution itself um, and the provision it appears in, they contend that you should be able to read it and understand it. Textualism is a form of originalism. It's sometimes considered a strict form of originalism, which I will discuss uh, in a moment. Now, there are several fa arguments in favor of textualism, at least um, according to textualists. Um, and the first is that those uh, textualists maintain that the Constitution says what it says and means what it says. And in addition, since a Constitution is an organic legal document, in other words, it's establishing the government, and one of, if not the primary purpose of our written Constitution is to protect citizens from the government, it should be strictly construed against the government. Second, uh, textualists argue that textualism reflects the well-recognized legal principle that interpreting legislative enactments the first thing that a judge should do is read the provision that's at issue. So if before a judge comes an issue of what does a statute mean, what does a constitution mean, everyone, every lawyer would agree with this. And you see it stated over and over in appellate decisions coming down who are, when the appellate court is being asked to construe or apply a statute is, the first thing we do is we read the statute. If we can tell simply by reading the statute what it means, we are bound by that meaning. It is only in the circumstance where when I read the statute, I being a judge, if I read a statute and it is ambiguous to me as to what it means, only then can I go outside the words of the statute and look for other um, indications of what the legislative intent was. But even then, what the principle of law requires is that the court be looking for what the legislature's intent was in enacting the particular law at issue. And they can look at several different sorts of things. Um, they, they look at um, committee reports. They look at statements of legislators that are on record um, during the process of enacting the legislation. They'll look at other laws that may be related to that particular enactment. And of course, there's critics of textualism. Uh, the most often um, recited criticism of textualism is that in many cases, one cannot, in fact, determine from the meaning, uh, determine the meaning merely by reading the text, even in context. They point out that words have different meanings, even at the time they were originally used. They point out that written legislation, including constitutions, are often inarticulately drafted. They're ambiguous. They are either unintentionally or sometimes uh, intentionally fail to address many issues arising under the legislation in practice. That legislation by its nature is sort of general and is left to the courts to apply in practice. So those are the, so that's textualism, criticisms of textualism, and um, arguments in favor of textualism. The next thing I'm going to talk about is originalism. I'm going a little faster than I did this morning. Try to get as much in as I can before they pull the plug on me. So originalism, um, like textualism, is a formalist theory. And to complicate matters, there are really two kinds of originalism, and they're oftentimes uh, misunderstood or not recognized, this distinction between original intent and original meaning. 
Original tent, intent views uh, the Constitution as being a document that should be looked at from the original subjective intent of the drafters of the Constitution. In other words, what did the drafters of the Constitution intend when they enacted it? Okay. And they break down, original intentists break that down into functional intent and motivational intent. In other words, they can look at two kinds of intent. Functional intent is looking at what did the drafters intend to accomplish when they enacted this provision. What problem were they trying to solve? What issues were they trying to address? The motivational intent simply means that they're looking at the subjective intent of the drafters. Why did the drafters subjectively, what did the drafters subjectively intend to do when they enacted this particular provision? That frankly is what most people think of when the um, concept of originalism or of original intent is used is motivational intent. An example of the distinction between those two is that in Article Section One, Article One, Section Two of the United States Constitution, it originally provided that for purposes of um, direct, uh, direct taxation and figuring out how many representatives a state should have in the House of Representatives, that a state's inhabitants would be counted, all of their free inhabitants and three fifths of their unfree inhabitants, which of course was a, a nod to slaves without having to use that word. It might be speculated that a northern delegate to the Constitutional Convention, their functional intent could very well have simply have been to create a computational method of determining proportional representation and direct taxation. But a northern delegate's motivational intent might have been, and I'm just speculating, but it might have been I have to do this, I have to make this compromise in order to get the slave states to even agree to enter into a written constitution at this period. So functional intent and motivational intent may be two different things. Several criticisms have, of course, been leveled against original intent. The first criticism um, is that people point out that many of the founders did not leave discussions of what their intent was in 1787 when the Constitution was, in fact, drafted and enacted, or drafted. The second criticism is that I, although a few founders did leave discussions of what their intent in 1787 was, Critics say there's no reason to hold that their particular view should be dispositive of what the rest of the founders thought. As an example, um, James Madison, who is oftentimes referred to as the founder of the Constitution, attended probably more of the um, sessions in the Constitutional Convention of, uh, than any other delegate, and he took extensive notes as to what they were discussing. As you recall, the Continental Congress actually closed the, the convention. It wasn't open to the public. It was um, purposely done in secret. Um, doors shut, windows shut in July um, in the heat and humidity of Philadelphia in order to be able to allow delegates to speak their minds. And Madison made extensive notes. They're referred to as Madison's notes, and they're often referred to um, when people are looking at what the intent of the drafters were. But a lot of the founders did not leave discussions. The third criticism related to the second is that if the founders who did leave discussions of their intent differ from one another, how does one determine the intent of the founders without giving some founders more weight than others? And what legitimate basis would there be for giving different weights to different founders' opinions? And finally, a related cri uh, criticism, and frankly the one you most often hear, is this, and that is a denial by critics that one can reliably discover the intent of the Continental Congress at all. That since there were 55 delegates to the Continental Con uh, Congress, or the, uh, the Constitutional Convention rather, um, that there was no unified or cohesive or collective intent that can be gleaned from them. Um, related to this is a criticism that goes further, which is, of course, after the Constitution was drafted, it was submitted to the various states for their ratification. Each state had a ratifying convention. They picked delegates in different ways. Um, but in all, there were 1,648 total delegates amongst the 13 original states who voted on the ratification of the Constitution. And again, critics contend that you can't determine um, what the collective intent was of 1,648 delegates to the ratifying conventions. The second 
type of originalism is original meaning. And the distinction between original meaning and original intent is this. Original meaning does not focus on the subjective intent of the drafters. Rather, it's based upon what a reasonable person living at the time of its drafting and ratification would have declared the ordinary meaning of the text to be. So it avoids the problems that I've just outlined with respect to the criticisms of can you discern a collective intent of the delegates? Can you um, rely upon the expressed intent of a few of the delegates when there were 55 delegates, it avoids that problem by saying, okay, we're not gonna look at the subjective intent of the drafters of the Constitution. We're gonna look at what a reasonable person would have thought that provision meant at the time it was drafted. And in order to do that, original meaningists um, look at different sources like, um, if for example, they were wondering, Hey, what did the drafters of the Constitution mean when they used the frame, phrase due process in the U.S. Constitution? Um, we can't find anything with respect to um, the intent of the drafters. We can look at things such as Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England, which discussed that issue and which was a heavily respected and widely relied upon source uh, for legal terms and legal concepts at that time. They would look if a particular word was at issue. Well, how is that word used? We all know, for example, being conversant with the King James Bible, sometimes we have a difficulty determining what exactly was being meant in King James English. Um, well, the same policy or the same process can be um, looked to with respect to intentional meaning in the sense that if there's a, if there's a word that is at issue, what did that word mean? they oftentimes will look at sources like Samuel Johnson's dictionary so that they can determine at that time what did that word mean. Did it mean the same thing we think it means now or did it mean something different then? And if it did mean something different then, what does it mean? Now Justice Scalia, I, I have a little handout there and, and um, the back page is just to give you little photographs of um, the two justices that I'm gonna be mentioning, Justice Scalia um, and Justice Breyer. Justice Scalia said this about original meaning theory and the distinction between original meaning and original intent. He said, the theory of originalism treats a constitution like a statute and gives it the meaning that its words were understood to bear at the time they were promulgated. You will sometimes hear it described as the theory of original intent. You will never hear me refer to original intent because as I say, I am first of all a textualist and secondly, an originalist. If you are a textualist, you don't care about the intent. And I don't care if the framers of the Constitution had some secret meaning in mind when they adopted its words. I take the words as they were promulgated to the people of the United States and what is the fairly understood meaning of those words. So Scalia, he, he's oftentimes referred to as an original intentist, but he indicates obviously that he is not an original intentist, he's an originalist, original meaningist, if I can coin a word. Um, and of course there's criticisms of original meaning. Critics of original meaning take issue with the same problem they, they, they take issue with in original intent, which is they, they argue that one cannot determine with any degree of certainty what a reasonable person living at the time of the Constitution's drafting would have declared the ordinary meaning of the text to be. The biggest and most general kind of criticism against originalism is that um, to restrict our understanding of the Constitution to the standard of what the framers intended or what the text reads or what the meaning was at the time is to render our Constitution a dead, unresponsive, and archaic document that does not serve the needs of 20th, 21st century Americans. Arguments in favor of originalism and that treat or respond to that particular criticism is this, and that is that only originalism creates a reasonable, objective standard for constitutional inter interpretation. In fact, proponents of originalism claim that outside originalism, not only is there no standard, but that outside originalism, there can be no standard. And that even though proponents of living constitution theory 
purport to have a standard. For example, what I'll refer to in a minute, uh, Justice Breyer refers to act of, the act of liberty standard. Originalists say that that's really no standard at all. It's a standard that makes a pretense of objectivity, act, objectivity, but in fact, it's only a way of referring to what a particular justice subjectively believes is right or good or preferable or wise. Um, and certainly, um, you can have criticisms of originalism, which I've pointed out. Justice Breyer recognizes those, or, I'm sorry, Justice Scalia recognizes those criticisms. His response is a little bit like Winston Churchill's statement that capitalism is the worst economic system in the world, except for every other one. Justice Scalia says the same thing about originalism, which is, I don't mean to say it does not have its problems, but it's the best system that we can have if we are trying to restrain judicial activism. Let me make some comments on the living constitution theory. Um, the living constitution theory posits that the constitution was by necessity limited by and to the time in which it was drafted and that that was a very different time in a variety of respects than the present. Adherence to living constitutional theory will oftentimes point to technological advances that have occurred in the last 200 years and say look, the founders could not possibly have foreseen what our society is like. They don't have the knowledge we have. And so we cannot rely upon our founders to determine what our Constitution should say. And Justice Breyer is the primary advocate and proponent of the living Constitution theory. He has written a book called Active Liberty, Interpreting Our Democratic Constitution. And his premise is this, that the U.S. Constitution has an overarching purpose that really has two um, functional purposes attached to it. And that is the U.S. Constitution was enacted in order to protect citizens' liberties, and to ensure their participation in democracy. And that, therefore, what U.S. Supreme Court justices need to do when looking at any particular case is to keep those two issues in mind and ask themselves, is our result going to result in active liberty? Is it going to promote the liberty of citizens? And is it going to promote their active participation? The criticisms of the living constitution theory, of course, is that there are no objective parameters for that interpretation, okay? We can all agree, I think, that both of those things are good things. Protecting the liberty of citizens is a good thing and protecting their participation in democracy is a good thing. But I would doubt that many people could necessarily agree on what measures are most appropriate to those ends. And so, Originalists criticize the living constitution on the grounds that there are no, under the living constitution theory, there are no parameters that restrain judges, that it makes the constitution mean anything, and that if it can mean anything, it means nothing. Um, let me give an example of one of the cases that has arisen under what I would call the living constitution theory. Um, and that's the Griswold versus Connecticut case, which is a Supreme Court case in 1965. In that case, what was at issue was um, a Connecticut law, a state law, that imposed a very low fine on the use of birth control. And it went before the Supreme Court as to whether or not that particular state law was constitutional. And Justice Douglas wrote an opinion which said this. He, he coined a now famous phrase, writing, specific guarantees in the Bill of Rights have penumbras formed by emanations from those guarantees that help give them life and substance, and that those emanations from penumbras create a right to privacy no less important than any other right carefully and particularly reserved to the people. So a couple things that are, no, that are noticeable in that statement. Um, number one is Justice Douglas is finding constitutional rights arising out of penumbras. A penumbra is a shadow. I had to look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> it's it's um, a space of partial illumination. And an emanation, of course, is something that comes out of that. So he was finding a constitutional right, not that was not only expressed in the Constitution expressly, but that arose, he said, out of an 
emanation from a shadow in the Constitution. The problem that originalists would have with that, of course, is if that's the reasoning you use in order to reach your conclusion, what are the limits of that reasoning? And the fact of the matter is, subsequent cases have demonstrated that there really isn't a limit on what kind of results you can find in using that sort of reasoning. I'm going to skip over some of the things that I was otherwise going to say in it because I'm, also, I'm already running out of time and Dean King is going to yell at me. <laughs> uh, one of the things that, that I look at when deciding, because, you know, I guess equally reasonable people could come to either conclusion and become either originalist or a living constitutionalist. There are valid arguments on both sides. There are criticisms of both theories. So let's look quickly at what some of the results of both of those have been. Um, critics of originalism point, in order to be fair here, critics of originalism point to the antebellum Supreme Court decisions that essentially held kind of taking a um, textualist view of the Constitution that held that the United States government did not have the authority to interfere with slavery. And there were many of those sorts of cases, and that's in fact what the Constitution said at that time. Living constitutionalists say, what an injustice. Was it unjust? It was unjust. But how it was remedied was through amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Okay? They weren't remedied by judges deciding that what the Constitution provided for should no longer hold. Now let me go to the other side. Judge Furman referred to a case uh, called Lawrence versus Texas. And as he explained, it struck down Texas criminal sodomy law, essentially on the basis of what, again, I would call the living constitutional theory of interpretation. And what's amazing to me when I do read that case is that in Lawrence versus Texas, the Supreme Court went through a historical analysis of anti-sodomy laws in the United States and found that anti-sodomy laws and admitted that anti-sodomy laws were prevalent not only in pre, not only during colonial times, but during the time of the ratification of the Constitution as well. Not only were they prevalent, prevalent they were universal. But despite that, um, the court in Lawrence versus Texas overturned as unconstitutional the Texas anti-sodomy law, despite the fact that only 16 years earlier in a U.S. Supreme Court case, they had upheld Georgia's anti-sodomy law as being constitutional. And what I think is illuminating to us is are these words from the Lawrence v. Texas case where the court said, in all events, in other words, despite all the previous history that anti-sodomy laws are constitutional, we think that our laws and traditions in the past half century are of most relevance here. These references show an emerging awareness, an emerging awareness that liberty gives substantial protection to adult persons in deciding how to conduct their private lives in matters pertaining to sex. This emerging recognition should have been apparent when we decided Bowers. So in 16 years, they went from this kind of a law is constitutional to this kind of a law is unconstitutional. And that, unfortunately, is the sort of results that living constitutional theory leads you to, that you can come to two diametrically opposite results on essentially the same facts. And what the court relied upon, which is even a little more disturbing, is they essentially rejected their own reasoning in previous cases and looked to scholarly, what they, they termed contemporary scholarly works. They looked, as Judge Furman pointed out, to cases from the European Court of Human Rights. They relied upon a commission report that was... Um, drafted in order to give the British Parliament advice on their own laws concerning homosexuality. Um, so they went far outside even the American sources in order to determine what they should hold. 
And in fact, the court, when it, decide, when it cited the European Court of Human Rights decision, said that, the, that one of the reasons they were overturning their own previous decision was that the European Court of Human Rights decision, quote unquote, is at odds with the premise in our previous case of Bowers. So in other words, the court relied upon so-called emerging awarenesses and emerging recognitions, as well as contemporary scholarly works, which frankly you could probably find um, scholarly works on both sides of any case that a, that a court is considering, and in addition relied upon actions taken by foreign governments and courts to find that a law that was constitutional in 86 was unconstitutional under that same constitution 17 years later. And that is the primary criticism of the living constitution theory, is that it does not restrain judges in what they can do. And of course, if you look historically at what's happened when Griswold versus Connecticut was first decided and the right of privacy was determined to exist from emanations from penumbras, it went from Griswold versus Connecticut, unconstitutional, um, to criminalize birth control, to Roe v. Wade, criminal, um, decriminalizing abortion, to Lawrence v. Texas, in which they essentially said there is no basis for, there's no constitutional basis to uphold state laws that are based on morality. And in fact, Justice Scalia in the Lawrence v. Texas wrote a blistering dissent where he said, look, if this is what the United States Supreme Court has come to as far as pulling out from the states any ability to base any legislation on morality, there can be no moral basis for any legislation. And he warned, frankly, in his dissent of coming problems the court would have to contend with when that envelope is pressed further and further by special interest groups. I want to read um, one thing in closing. And that is um, from a, a law review article that was written by um, Professor Cass R. Sunstein who used to be with the uh, University of Chicago, is now with Harvard Law School. In 1999, he uh, penned a University of Chicago Law Review article entitled Formalism and Statutory Interpretation, Must Formalism Be Defended Empirically? Now before I read this to you, I gave this warning this morning, I'll give it again. I am not saying that living constitutionalists are Nazis. I'm not saying that they're fascists. I'm reading this from this particular law review article from an author that frankly is oftentimes a critic of originalism, but this is what he wrote in his law review, law review article. In the Nazi period, German judges rejected formalism. They did not rely on the ordinary or original meaning of legal texts. On the contrary, they thought that statutes should be construed in accordance with the spirit of the age, defined by reference to the Nazi regime. They thought that courts could carry out their task only if they do not remain glued to the letter of the law. After the war, Professor Cass continues, the Allied forces faced a range of choices about how to reform the German legal system. One of their first steps was to insist on a formalistic, plain meaning approach to law. Such laws enacted in the Hitler period as had not been voided were to be interpreted in accordance with the plain meaning of the text and without regard to objectives or meanings ascribed in preambles or other pronouncements. Again, I'm not saying that's America, but I'm saying just because that's an extreme example of what can happen under a kind of a living constitution or a broad interpretation theory of constitutional or legal interpretation, just because that's an extreme example doesn't invalidate it as an example and is, I think, a warning to us that we need to be vigilant um, with respect to this issue. Thank you. I want to ask my question um, so that it'll give somebody a chance to think about their answer and then I want to make a couple of points. My question is, how can we as faculty and staff help instill into our students an understanding of the meaning of sovereignty, the importance of sovereignty, and how um, in our society somehow the idea of, of sovereignty has gotten mixed up with um, 
uh, who we should let immigrate into our borders and who we should not let Im immigrate into our borders and a, an idea of uh, that America being number one in, in our economic uh, powers is somehow bad and we're looked at as bad around the world. It's my understanding when the students come in that they are ashamed of a sense of sovereignty and ashamed of a sense of America, and how do we get that to turn around? Um, one of the points I want to make about um, about limited government and um, free markets is that it is the um, movement of the Constitution and a never changing Constitution or or or. Uh, idea of the Constitution that makes free markets very difficult because it's like going to a baseball game and saying, wait, let's change the rules. So once the entrepreneurs have an idea of what they're going to do to make a society go and take their risks, changing the rules on them reduces the amount that the entrepreneurs are then willing to risk in a society. And it also reduces the amount that we are sure we should teach our students because if the Constitution is changing, we can't can't give our students what is going to be tomorrow. We have to wait and see what it's going to be tomorrow before we give it to them. So in order for us to teach business in a way that is going to be, we can't do that if the Constitution is changing. And that limits the way that we are able to work in a free market society. I wanted to uh, follow up on the, the idea of what can we do for our students. Part of what we can do is what we're doing now. When we did the uh, PowerPoint earlier, most of you did not know those things. And were, those were things that were selected to be difficult, things that seemed out of the ordinary. If there's anything good about what's happening in the current campaign is that it's a, hundreds of thousands of people are being mobilized who have not before been mobilized. I heard this morning uh, that in a particular area of Houston, uh, where the last uh, election had only 30,000 voters turn out, already have 80,000 uh, early voters. Uh, that's before the election day. Uh, <clears throat> what we need to do and what we must do with our students is to help them make educated decisions. And in the words of my friend Gary Ewan, actions have consequences and inactions also have consequences. If our students don't become involved, regardless of what their position is, they're going to inherit a government that they didn't sign on for. Fight postmodernism. Fight relativism. Fight the subtly disguised idolatry of politics in general and, and America as a nation in particular. Now you just said that you encounter students who are not proud of America or being Americans and this is tragic that this is happening to them in their high schools and their families uh, through the entertainment industry and through the media that they take in. And presume and these are by definition these are church going kids it's happening to them in their churches this is this is deeply tragic. We ought to we ought to be looking into the books of Chronicles and Kings and Samuel and the major and minor prophets in the scriptures and asking ourselves where we fit in this picture because they, these are bad times for America and worse times coming. But I think you have the opportunity, as I tried to say a minute ago, as an educational institution grounded in scripture to fight relativism, postmodernism, every form of, of idolatry, whether, whether it demonizes America or unduly glorifies America. I can't find America in my Bible. If you've got an edition of the Bible that tells me anything about America, it would be a surprise to me. Now, our, our LDS friends, they, they have their Book of Mormon, which at least uh, alludes to the uh, Western Hemisphere, but I can't find it in, uh, in the Scripture. And if we can help students understand that a big fork in the road comes where you either believe Jefferson and the founders who say we hold these truths to be self-evident or what it, the alternative is that they're with Pilate with his cynical shrug who says well what is truth? Truth is Pilate was a postmodernist before his time and and to the extent that the high schools and the other 
character forming, intellect forming agencies on your students that have operated up to the age of 18 are letting them down and you've got to remediate. I said earlier, you've got to rescue. You, you have both the opportunity and the obligation and really a, an urgent uh, crisis driven uh, imperative to <laughs> Challenge them. I don't, I don't care what discipline you teach. There's something in these strategic objectives and in this bundle of markers of what kind of America we want this to be that represents a point of entry for you to push back at all uh, of the educational malpractice that's been committed on these young people and all, all of the false conditioning that, uh, that has been uh, perpetrated on them. I feel, I guess I'm... Uh, too deep in uh, reading a chapter of Jeremiah every day in my devotional outline right now. I feel like Jeremiah, but I think that's where we are. We have time for one more question. It would appear from our discussion that those who would support the living interpretation of the Constitution might be more liberal-minded um, if we look in terms of liberal and conservative, and those who support an original interpretation might be more conservative-minded. It would also appear that the Chief Justices on the Supreme Court, it would be very important to know whether they are living theorists or original. With that in mind, is taking and returning the balance of power between the three branches of government simply a matter of having more originalists on the, cons on the uh, Supreme Court? And if so, I know lots of questions there. If so, um, how many judges might be moving off the Supreme Court during the next presidential session? I'll let uh, one of the judges, people talk to that if they want, but let me tell you that I think that's the single most critical issue in this election. Because the way we select Supreme Court, ju Supreme Court justices is by electing a president. Uh, do you know what kind of justice your candidate will support? And is that the kind of justice you want to have? Uh, there will be probably, I don't know what your thought is, Brad, I think there will be at least two retirements potentially within in the next, uh, and that's uh, right now we have a 5-4 split on the court, so the court's likely to swing the other way if we put someone in uh, who believes in a liberal interpretation of the Constitution versus original intent. I think it's the most significant issue in this election. No comments? I'm the only one here brave enough to be political. <laughs> Well, I would predict it's, uh, there could be as many as four retirements in the, uh, the term of the next president, especially if that president sits for eight years. And on a good day, you have 5-4 uh, for judicial restraint, Chuck, because Anthony Kennedy, as we've just been reminded, he can go either way. The second Carhartt case uh, that was uh, originated off of a federal statute that did uphold the Congress's ban on partial birth abortion, Kennedy uh, came with us on that one. Uh, uh, Judge Furman didn't address that. He addressed the Nebraska-originated uh, Carhartt case. Okay. But the other thing that I, uh, I feel like I'm just harping again and again on one theme here, improving the court is just one small part of a huge task to renew in America the vigilance that Jefferson said is the eternal price of liberty. That, that is... We need to renew civic virtue in the young people, some of whom will be casting their first vote this year, who are in your classes right now. We, civic virtue, including self-assertion to defend my liberties and self-restraint to conduct myself in a civilized way so I don't need a heavy hand of law upon me, uh, and self-reliance so I'm not a client of government dependency. All those things are part of the core skills and competencies of citizens. And, and as long as Americans are willing to elect a Congress and a president who are forever shoving things to the Supreme Court, you can't find good enough justices on the Supreme Court to remedy that because the whole system is out of balance. And you had a situation where President Congress passed 
the McCain-Feingold violation of your political free speech, your right to contribute money and make statements about candidates in an election. And they, th some of the people who voted for it in Congress knew that it was uh, abhorrent to the First Amendment. Bush knew it was abhorrent to the First Amendment. They passed it. He signed it. They hoped the Supreme Court would bail them out, but it didn't. Another more laughable example is Senator Harry Byrd of West Virginia passed this bill that Im impacts this university among many other universities and schools. It says every September, if you want to keep getting any form of federal money at all, you'll have a Constitution Day observance. Well, the trouble with that is there's no authorization in the Constitution itself for the federal government to hold a big club like that over Colorado Christian or Jefferson County Public Schools or any state or, or private institution at all. So Harry Byrd and the Congress and Bush signed this too are mocking their notion of fidelity to the Constitution or celebrate the Constitution every September 17th because they, in so doing, they're violating the Constitution. This is the kind of Congress we've got, the kind of president we've got, and the kind of Supreme Court we got. Fortunately, we got Representative Kevin Lundberg in the State House, or I'd just go jump off a cliff. <laughs> well, it's time for us to close. Let me uh, go back to a very, very pertinent question you asked him and close with this remark. One of the things that we can do, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I would venture to say there aren't very many people in the room who, who can even name the nine justices on the Supreme Court, let alone have any idea what their philosophy of interpretation is. Wait a minute, there's Snoopy, Dopey, Sleepy. <laughs> if we are to help our students, we need to encourage them to get involved, understand what the actions are that are taking place in Washington, D.C., and what their role can be in that. That's the most important thing uh, we can do. Because I quite frankly think one of the weaknesses, we have many, many strengths at CCU. But if I were to cite one weakness, I think is that many of our students really don't think about what they're going to do in the real world until the second semester of their senior year. Fortunately, in student life and in the leadership programs, uh, we're really trying to move people in that direction. But I still think we have a group of students who are primarily interested in college right now and haven't really thought about what they're going to do, and they're all voters. They're the ones that are going to make these decisions. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here this afternoon.